from the book of James, chapter 4, verse 17. And it reads, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for you it is sin. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our today's sermon is coming from Brother Bongani Kama. Bongani Kama is a graduate from the Southern African Bible College. He's also a preacher and now at a trade field west. He is married with three children, so he is a sound a speaker and an excellent preacher of the way. So I'm looking forward to his sermon. Again. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, for 
second, I thought that I'm talking alone. <laughs> now, the pursuit of faith must lead to works, whether we like it or not. That's why the word erga in the book of James comes up a little bit more often. Because erga means work. The book is focused on things that are practical that we need to do. We cannot just walk around and tell people that we are Christians. But when people look at us, they don't see that we are Christians. Remember these people, they are scattered and they are living in a pagan world. So James is saying to them that in your state of life in a pagan society, the pagan people, they must be able to look at you and they must be able to reflect who Christ is through your lives. So this is a push and an encouragement to all of us who are sitting here that when we look at the book of James, we need to remember that action is at the core of everything. Now, since the book is actually focusing on the practicality of things, it's practical in nature. So there are certain things that the book is actually correcting amongst brethren. Because there were certain tendencies that Christians were actually holding on to in those societies that they were living in. Number one, they were weak in faith. And I'm guessing, Bazarwani, that we, we, we could be amazed by the idea of rebuking those who are weak in faith. Because we are supposed to grow in faith. I get it, Bazarwani. Yeah. Sometimes we fail in that. We, we love ourselves so much that we even forget the next person. You become so big in your eyes that you love yourself more than anybody else. So James is also rebuking there. He's also talking about that. That you cannot simply, you, you simply cannot be so weak in love that you, you simply forget that you have other people around you. And also he's talking about the murmuring and the complaining. You know Christians, they love complaining. But love. When the good times come, we complain. When the bad times come, we complain, okay? So people love complaining. It's, it's simply human nature, complaining. And, and it's rebuking there because we, we, we are not to be people who murmur and complain because our faith is in the Lord. So therefore we cannot complain whether we face good times or that we face bad times. We don't complain. And he also talks about the fact that people were quarreling and then there were also people who were arrogant in that particular church that he's actually talking to. And sometimes you, you find that in other congregations where you get that, that the congregation is not moving forward because people are busy quarreling about something that has nothing to do with the scriptures. So the church is standing still. The church is not even preaching the gospel anymore because we are busy solving issues that have nothing to do with what the scripture is actually talking about. Because people are too proud again. And also people are abusing their rights as preachers. Hallelujah. Yeah. You know how preachers are. That's why in chapter 3 verse 1 it says, Not many of you should become teachers. Because you are going to be judged more strictly. So people are abusing their rights of, 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 being, of being teachers or preachers in those particular churches. You know sometimes how teachers and preachers are in the congregation. So he's, he's rebuking them also that do not be like that. And, and also people were abusing the, the fact that they were taking oaths and vows before the Lord. So he's correcting that also. And he's also talking to the people who are seeking revenge against other people. So he's rebuking them. So this is just a simple breakdown of what the book is actually talking about. Before we go to the actual text itself and discuss the text that will be given in hand. So, before we go to verse 17, I want us to begin in chapter 4, verse 1, so that we might be able to have a background story of what's happening in verse 17. In verse 1 of that particular chapter, a James says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights amongst you? It is not this, that your passions are at war within you. So he's asking a rhetorical question, Pastor Juan, because he already gives them the answer. He's going to give them the answer. And they already know what makes them quarrel. But it's actually trying to make them understand that the source of your quarrels is deep lying in your passions, Pastor Juan. Right. Because the word for desire, there is hedone in Greek, can also be translated as passion. Sometimes you're so passionate about what you feel that you do not even care what the Bible is actually saying. Hallelujah. Amen. 
We are so passionate about things sometimes, we even forget to involve God in those decisions that we are trying to make. So people were quarreling, they were fighting against one another. And he's actually saying to them, what is the source of your fight? You're not fighting about doing what is good. You're not fighting about preaching the gospel. You're not fighting about doing what is, what is right in the church of the Lord. But what you are fighting about is, the, is you. You are fighting about yourselves. You are fighting amongst yourselves because of yourselves. Because you are self-centered. You are arrogant. You are seeking your own self-righteousness. It has nothing to do with the righteousness of the Lord. And that is why you're fighting amongst yourselves. You're not even preaching the gospel anymore. You're not even doing what is right in the communities at large anymore. And remember, Bazerwade, the pagan world is looking at the church. And the church is arguing and quarreling amongst itself about petty issues that do not even have nothing to do with the scriptures. And that's why he says to them, why are you arguing? Because the pagans are looking at you and yet you're busy quarreling. How can you teach them what is right if you yourself do not even seek what is right? What kind of an example are you setting? And Paul says to us in Romans chapter 12, verse 9 to 10, he says, Let love be genuine. He says, Abhor what is evil and hold fast to what is good. And then he says, Love one another with brotherly love, affection. Sometimes we're fighting because we are self centered. And sometimes we're too proud and arrogant to admit that it has nothing to do with the scriptures, but it has everything to do with us and our passions and our desires and our pleasures. For the, the world can also be translated as pleasure or desire. What you desire should not be more than what God desires from you. You should not seek to pleasure your desires more than you seek to, de to, to pleasure what God desires from you. And the reason why they are fighting and quarreling is the fact that they have not submitted themselves to God. Hallelujah. When you get to verse 4 to verse, verse 10 of the same chapter, listen to what James is saying. He says, submit yourself therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And then he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Yes. He says, the fact that you're quarreling amongst you is that you have not given yourself over to God. You are still self-seeking. Self you are still seeking your own things. You are not seeking the things of the Lord. And that is why you are in this position at this time. And then he says to them, move away from these things and draw nearer to God. Because if you draw nearer to God, you die a little bit. If you draw nearer to God, yourself dies a little bit. And God lives more boldly in you. And he is visible for everyone to see. And that's why he says, if you draw near, God draws near. I get it, Brother if you seek him, you shall find him. So sometimes we are in this mess because of ourselves. And the only way to get out of this mess is to come closer to God and then ask him to get us out of these messes. You know, sometimes you find people arguing and quarreling. Not because it has to do with something that is beneficial for the church, but because they just want to cause quarrels and division amongst the church. And then he gets to boasting, verses 13 to 14. He says, 
Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and claim the big profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. You see, one thing you need to understand about the characteristic of the church in that particular area is that people were rich in that particular church and they had aspirations to be more richer. And sometimes we are also in that boat as people who are living on earth because we want to achieve success. Who doesn't want to achieve success? You see, I don't see any hands. So we all want to achieve success. And then he comes to this point, he directs our attention to these things in terms of making one of these plans for our lives. He says, come now you who say you're going to go to such a place and do business for a year and then you want to take and make profit in that particular. And then he asks them a question and then he says, what is your life? You see, James is not saying that we shouldn't plan our lives. He's not saying that. Yes. Okay? He's not saying that you shouldn't plan your life. But it's just reminding you that when you plan your life, make sure that your plans begin with God. Amen. Because sometimes we do all of these plans, but God is not even involved in his plans. Our plans are just me, myself, and I, and nobody else. But it's reminding them that when you, when you do all of these things, ask yourself this particular question. What is your life? What is your Because it could be here today, and tomorrow it could not be here. So when you plan all of these things, make sure that you have God in your sight. Make sure that you understand where you stand with God. That's why in verse 14 he says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what is your life. And then when you get to verse 15 he says, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, was the Lord. If the Lord wills. Now I want to touch on that particular word uh, that they say in the Greek. This is a verb, and it's an iorist, it's an active, it's a, it's a subjunctive. Now, I want to talk about the mood subjunctive here, which I bring to you. The mood of subjunctive here actually expresses the probability or the possibility of something. Hence, he says that if you want to do something, make sure that you include the Lord in your planning. Because there might be a possibility that you might not exist tomorrow. But if you include the Lord in your plans, there's a bigger possibility that if you do not even exist in this world tomorrow, you get to inherit eternity. Ah, yes. So do we see what he's talking about here? He says we need to let the Lord lead us into those places that we want to go to. And, and, and in Psalms 127 verse 1 it says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. So do not plan in vain. But make sure that God is part of your plans. Do not do things in vain. But make sure that God is part of those actions that you do. You know, sometimes we know that we ought to do the right things. But because we do not include God in those right things that we want to do. And that's why sometimes they don't even materialize those things. Because we don't include God. Even for the church, when we plan as leaders, sometimes we plan as leaders, but we plan in the absence of God. Rather than planning in the presence of God so that whatever plan we want to execute, God is part of the process. God is part of the plan. When you want to hire a preacher, as the church, as the leaders, you need to pray about it. You need to include God in your, in your plan and processes. So that when the preacher comes, he comes and preaches where God wants him to preach. Amen. Or instead, someone will walk in here and then he starts spitting fire from, from, from the devil. Because we didn't include God. We didn't involve God in the process, in the planning of those things. And that's why we need to say, if the Lord wills, then I shall have life tomorrow. Amen. If the Lord wills, then tomorrow I will do such and such, and I will do one, two, three, four, five. In verse 16, he says, 
In verse 16, he says, As it is, you boast in your arrogance, and such boasting is evil. He says, If you plan without God, you are boasting in your arrogance. And if you do that, then whatever you do is evil. Hallelujah. If you do that, you are boasting in arrogance, and whatever you do is evil. If you want to do things without God, those things that you do, they might translate to be evil things. Because you need to involve God in the holistic life that you're living on earth. See, we're, we're looking at a church that they are living in the pagan world, and the pagan people are looking at them. And the pagan people are saying, if, if those people are living from God, they need to make sure that God is in everything that they do. Because the pagan people, they involve their idols in everything that they do. So James is saying to them, you need to show that you're people of God. And do not boast about tomorrow. Because you do not know what tomorrow will bring. You do not even have keys to life. So he gets to verse 17. And in verse 17 he says, So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. I want us to look at this word. So, whoever knows. Uh, I was using uh, the ESV here. Uh, the New King James has a different way that it uses there. So he says, whoever knows a doji, that's the way that it's used there. And a doji can also be translated as to be aware, to consider, or to perceive. To be aware, to consider, or to perceive. You see, what we need to understand is that God makes us aware of things that we ought to know. The reason we come to church every single Sunday, the reason we go to Bible studies is that we want to acquire knowledge from God. And once we acquire knowledge from God, that means we know what we need to do. And that's why repentance is an opportunity of a, of a daily basis. On a daily basis, we are given an opportunity to repent. Because once we know that we have done something wrong, we are given an opportunity to change what is wrong in our lives. So God says to us that we are made aware through scriptures every single Sunday when we are preached to. And then we are to consider what we have learned. I want us to look at this thing. He says, to consider is to think about something carefully, especially regarding taking action. James is a book of what? Practicalities. It's a book of action. So we consider what we have learned, we consider the knowledge we have gathered, so that we might be able to take what? Action. Because we simply cannot come and learn and learn and learn and do not take action. We need to learn so that we might be able to take action. Because it's useless if we come here every single Sunday or we listen to Bible studies, but our lives are not even changing in the right direction. This is what Paul says in Philippians 4 8. He says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. He says, Meditate upon these things. Meditate upon these things. And when you get to verse 9, it says, What you have learned, again, we come, we learn, we acquire knowledge. Paul says, What you have learned and received and had and seen in me. He says, Practice these things, and God of peace will be with you. Paul says, You have learned from me, you have heard from me, you have seen from me. So, therefore, practice these things. So I want us to look at this idea of practicality here in the sense of what Paul is actually talking about. He says we need to practice whatever we have heard repeatedly so up until it becomes our lifestyle. Habitually we put these things into practice. Every day we try and do them. Every day we try and do them. Not just a habit for the sake of a habit, but a habit that involves the love and the heart in it. And that's why Christ says, if you, if you, what is, what, what, what is the command, what is the, 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 the second biggest commandment is loving God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, with everything that you have. So habitually means I'm putting everything that makes me who I am into this thing so that I might be able to do it in such a way that God is proud and pleased with it. This is 
is what Paul is saying. He says, you have been given knowledge. You have been empowered. Now use what has been given unto you. Put it into practice. Don't just take and take and take and take and take. Every day we come, we consume, we consume, we consume. But we just consume us without any action. And I would love to believe that Hilltop Church of Christ gives the best quality when it comes to sermons. But what good is that quality if we can't even use it in our lives? What good is that quality if we don't even take it into consideration? What good is that quality if we're still living the same lives that we lived before? What good is that quality if we are still rolling around the same mud that we used to roll around before? There has to be a certain change. There has to be a certain direction that we're taking because the word for repentance actually gives us an idea of someone who was going in a certain direction and now he stops and then he turns around to a different direction. That's what repentance means. Repentance means I was going this way and now I have a change of mind. I'm going in a different direction. I am no longer going there. That's what repentance is. So we do it repeatedly until it becomes our everyday uh, lifestyle. We do it. We do it. We do it with agents. Why? Because he uses this as a verb in that particular verse, verse 17. He says, one who knows the right thing to do, to do, to do, to do. That's a present infinitive active. Infinitives in the Greek actually are used to complete a certain idea, an important idea that needs to come across. They are used in an in in infinitive actually gives us the idea that it, it is completed that particular idea for us. So what is James actually trying to complete here? He's trying to complete the idea of us doing things, but he's actually trying to push us in the right direction by showing us the agency of doing the right things. He's saying, yes, you know that you ought to do these things, but you need to do it urgently. Why? First of all, you are not promised tomorrow. First of all, you don't know what your life is. But if you do it now, what is right now, then you put yourself in a position where God is pleased with you. So when you want to do right, now is the right time. Not tomorrow, as a we need to plan today to do the right things. You know, sometimes we plan all of these things around our lives, but we forget planning, doing what is good, what is what is right and what is good. You know, sometimes we even plan the evil in our mind. We even plan of becoming evil to one another. Right? When you cross one another, then you will be planning in your mind that when I when I see that person next time, I'm gonna give them a piece of my mind. You see your planning. You're planning, you're planning in your mind. I'm planning to give him a piece of my mind. Next time if he crosses the line, I'm on top of him. You see, you're planning that thing. You're planning evil in your mind. Instead of substituting that, you say, next time. I think Romans chapter 12 says we repay evil with good. We repay evil with instead of instead of planning in your mind the good things that you're gonna do to that person, even if they crossed you. The next time I see him, I'm gonna give him a big hug. So we do, we do with agency. Because serving God and doing things that are good needs us to be agent. It needs us to sit down and plan today and do it today. We're not planning for tomorrow, but we're planning for today. We're not planning for tomorrow, we're planning for today. That I want to do good today. I want to be a good person today. If I had, if I had something that was lacking in between us that makes us not to see one another with the right eye, today I need to fix that. If, if we were not on talking terms today, I need to fix that. If you and I had a certain quarrel that did not end well, today I need to fix that. Not tomorrow, today. Today is the day, was a man. And if I know that I'm here and I've not received the gospel, 
2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Today is the day of salvation. And getting to know God in that particular way is a very good thing for you to do. So plan it for today, but don't plan it for tomorrow. In closing, verse 1, we are taught that we need to submit to God so that we might be able to win the desires of our hearts over. You cannot maintain self-control over your desires without God. And God is teaching us each and every day. And we are taught that boasting about the things that we're going to do about tomorrow is evil. And we're also given the knowledge that we are to change our lifestyle if we see that we have been sinning against God. And what we need to understand is that we are told that we need to change today, not tomorrow, today. So the agency in doing what is right is today. The agency of doing what is right is eminent and is in your face. So don't push it to the next day. Don't push it to the next month. Don't push it to next year. But make sure that today is the day that you aim and try and do what is right.